Focus your mind on reciting the Buddha's name and realize your Buddha nature. Reciting the Buddha's name throughout your daily activities. During the seven-day retreat, the objective is to push aside all thoughts and focus solely on reciting Amitabha Buddha's sacred name continuously and single-mindedly. But if you don't know the proper way to recite the Buddha's name, it will never be right because you don't understand the real purpose of this recitation. It is like using a jewel as a marble. You are unaware of its value. Buddhists are not the only ones who practice recitation. Other religions and faiths also engage in their own forms of recitation, but they may not know the real purpose of such practice. That is why it is necessary to explain the basic concepts to beginners. Some ignorant people, or even those who are intellectual, may think, what is so great about reciting Amitabha Buddha's name? These few words are simple enough for anyone to recite. Can you really put an end to one cycle of birth and death by means of this recitation alone? Can you really benefit from this recitation? This recitation method is merely suitable for old people. I have sympathy for people who say that the practice of reciting Amitabha Buddha's name is only good for old people. As a matter of fact, ordinary people simply do not have enough merits and wisdom to understand the essence of Buddha recitation. Only the great bodhisattvas like Manjushri and Samantabhadra can truly know the essence of this sacred name and recite it to perfection. How can ordinary people ever recite it well? A three-year-old child may recite the Buddha's name, while an eighty-year-old man may not recite it well. Even if one begins this recitation at the age of three and carries on until one is eighty or a hundred years old, he or she may still be unfamiliar with the recitation. How familiar is familiar enough? It is when you uphold Amitabha Buddha's name throughout your daily activities, regardless of whether you are walking, staying still, sitting, or lying down. You cannot forget the Buddha's name even if you try. Once you are familiar with the recitation to such a degree, you will start to attain results. But it is not an easy task. If it were that simple, there would be no need for the countless volumes of sutras and commentaries to propagate the teachings of this recitation, nor the need for ancient sages to strenuously guide beings in this direction. It is a pity for those who do not know of this wonderful dharma. It is an even greater pity if you do not wholeheartedly abide by the teachings when you have this opportunity to learn from them. Tame your mind by reciting Amitabha Buddha's name. It is unfortunate that we were born into this dharma-ending age, because without the presence of a Buddha, we are like orphans with no parents. Although the Buddha left us the great canon to teach and guide us, it remains an issue whether we can truly understand it. If one were to use secular sentiments or worldly knowledge to interpret the Dharma literally, then he or she would have done a great injustice to the Buddhas of the past, present, and future. Often the scholars who study Buddhist scriptures claim to know them and are able to explain the teachings of the Buddha but they do not actually understand them. One who truly does understand the scriptures would not make such an immodest claim. Any understanding achieved in a purely academic way would be insubstantial, because the Buddha Dharma is for one to earnestly practice and uphold. The Buddha Dharma is like a compass and map that guides you. A Buddhist sutra may cover the ten directions of the Dharma realm and sentient beings of the ten Dharma realms. The broadness of these texts cannot be fathomed by your ordinary cleverness. One who can truly understand it and benefit from it are those who are able to accept their own ignorance and take a down-to-earth approach. You can only advance in Buddhist teachings when you bring forth the utmost sincerity and put to rest those erroneous thoughts, or else you will never truly enter through the doors of Buddhism. 
the Buddha came to our Saha world to open up the treasury of truth and lead sentient beings to understand and comprehend it. You cannot begin to realize Buddhahood if you do not possess the correct knowledge and perception of the Buddhas. You would be lucky enough to avoid going astray, much less realize Buddhahood. When we recite the Buddha's name, we must recite it with every thought and with a sense of Dharma joy. What does this mean? Take for example when a child eats their first candy. He or she will continue to eat one candy after another. Likewise, when bees are attracted to nectar, they will always fly back for the nectar, even if they were chased off. When you recite the Buddha's name with this level of consistency and persistence, you are well on your way. But whether you can utterly shoulder this sacred name will depend on whether you can open up the path to prajna wisdom. You need to acknowledge that when you are reciting Amitabha Buddha's name, you are in fact invoking your own Buddha nature, since your original nature is the same as the Buddha's. Your mind and the Buddha's mind can become one and will therefore be inseparable. However, this is not the same as false claims made by some ignorant people who claim themselves to be living Buddhas. The severity of such false claims can land one in the realm of hell. On the other hand, if one truly understands Buddhism, then these words are our will to practice and not false boasting. They are honest, sincere, and reliable words. Our mind is Amitabha Buddha's mind, while Amitabha Buddha's mind is our mind. Our mind and the Buddha's mind are inseparable. In fact, invoking the Buddha's name is invoking our original nature. We rely upon the accomplished virtues embedded within the sacred name to nourish our original minds. Amitabha Buddha was once in the same position as we are currently before he began his cultivation. If we can devote ourselves to practice like Amitabha Buddha did, then we will also achieve Buddhahood. Then that would be truly comprehending the fact that the mind, the Buddha, and sentient beings do not differ from one another. Distinguishing between the Buddha and the demon Within a hundred scholars who all possess a high level of academic knowledge, it is still very rare to find even one who can write about his or her experiences with Buddha recitation. To find out whether you have applied your efforts in the correct way, I can give you a mirror that reflects all evilness. When you recite the Buddha's name with Dharma joy, or see light, or flowers, or when someone is preaching the Dharma to you, does your mind remain subtle and serene, even unperturbed by your surroundings afterwards? Then you are on the right path. Regardless of what you see, you should treat your surroundings as a dream or an illusion. Acknowledge them, but do not be attached to them. If the experience is pleasant and positive, do not be overjoyed. If the experience is negative and frightening, do not feel afraid or be troubled by it. If you see evil spirits or headless ghosts haunting after you, or people trying to kill you with a knife or a gun, or even wild beasts pouncing at you, these are all due to past negative karma. Perhaps these beings are seeking revenge, or some are actually seeking help to be released. Therefore, we need to dedicate the merits from Buddha recitation to all of our enemies and foes. You should recite the Buddha's name with a Bodhi mind, and not be afraid of those negative images. Ignore them as though they do not exist. Whatever experiences a Dharma practitioner encounters during his or her practice, he or she will need to keep it in their hearts unless they are disclosing the experience to a genuinely wise advisor who can open up their mind and offer sound advice and guidance. In that case, you should openly and accurately express everything. The supposedly good advisors of today may be familiar with the doctrines, but some may not have attained any actual achievements in practice. If one is truly knowledgeable, he or she can tell at a first glance another's character, because one's state of mind is reflected through one's actions. An experienced person will know right away if a person is good or bad. If one is well cultivated, 
he or she can tell right away if someone else has the abilities. If you are not able yourself, you will not be able to judge if others are. Certainly, you can still acquire a better understanding of Buddhism by studying the Dharma texts and listening to the words of experienced ones. I merely recount the wise teachings of the ancients. If anything, perhaps I have studied just a bit more scriptures and listened to a bit more Dharma teachings. I do not possess superior knowledge or virtues. I am just honestly offering my genuine affections and guidance towards you all with words derived from life's experiences to enlighten your Buddha nature. All sentient beings have the same Buddha nature. Therefore, practicing Buddhism is not an extra curriculum, but an obligation we should undertake since we are all Buddhas in nature. But to realize our Buddha nature, we must engage in Buddha recitation. If you did not possess the Buddha nature within, how could you ever attain enlightenment? You can only get metal from an iron mine, and you can only get gold from a gold mine. How can you get any gold in a goldless mine? You must all understand and believe this. Why else would you be reciting the Buddha's name? We can attain Buddhahood because we possess the Buddha nature. But if you choose to become slaves to secular attachments such as the seven emotions and the six desires, or the five desires, and become a troubled sentient being who is bound to greed, then you will not have any blessings. If you cannot share your knowledge with others, then you do not possess wisdom. You must eliminate such petty thoughts and bring forth an enormous mind in order to amass virtues and obtain incredible results. Otherwise, your mind cannot be one with the Buddha's mind. Then, when do you expect to become a Buddha? This is why we must initiate the Bodhi mind. Not only benefit ourselves, but also to benefit others as well when we recite the Buddha's name and aspire to be reborn in the Western Pure Land. Ten Kalpas ago, there was no Western Pure Land. That land was created by Amitabha Buddha after innumerable Kalpas of cultivating a myriad of good deeds and the six Paramitas. Amitabha Buddha made great vows to create this land for all sentient beings. We also possess the same original nature as Amitabha Buddha. So if he can create such a land, why can't we? Of course, this would require a step-by-step -step process. At this moment, we should focus on creating monasteries so people can come and benefit from the Dharma. Without a monastery, where would people go for practice? This is how causes and conditions come into play. Buddhism is based on the relationship between causes, conditions, and their effects. At last, I hope everyone can devote themselves to planting good causes and thus receiving rewarding effects. Now, the best thing for everyone is to recite the Buddha's name and ultimately be reborn in the Western Pure Land of Ultimate Bliss. I hope everyone can obtain results in their recitation and achieve rebirth in the Western Pure Land.